प्रसार भारती अभिलेखा गार की प्रस्तुति सदा बहार सुनहरे दौर का अनमोल खजाना So they said, "Well, we feel very sorry for you." <laughs> so I said, "Well, <laughs> I feel even sorry for myself." I said, "Now I've come from Moscow with fur-lined boots and fur caps and uh, warm clothes. Now, now what do I do? I've got to go to SM." So uh, quickly, for my family, I collected some some clothes and a mosquito net and a lantern and what not, and uh, went off to SM. Now the governor was a uh, super cash, a very fine gentleman. Mm-hmm. He insisted that I stay with him in the government house. In government house, and uh, he, had, in the meantime, received a, a very strong letter about me and my mission, and he was very worried. Who wrote that letter? Sadar. Ah, yes. And it it was a very, if I may say so, a very complimentary letter. But he hadn't written about Section 93. When I mentioned this to him, he was really astonished and very worried. He said, "Look, uh, this is a popular government. If any such thing happens, you know, I, I'll resign. I, I won't stay here." I said, "No, it won't come to that. But I've got to use whatever tact I, I can muster in trying to persuade your, your government here to recognize the existence of a, of a very serious refugee problem, and not only a refugee problem, but..." Also, the disturbances all over the place in the plains. However, to cut a long story short, I said uh, I think we better call a cabinet meeting, and I'll try and uh, reassure them as to what my mission is. In the meantime, my arrival had created a certain flutter, both in the secretariat among the officials and among the ministers, as to who's this fellow who's arrived, because they hadn't been told about my mission. So the chief minister was Bardo Loi. A very nice man, amiable gentleman, but the man who ran the show was a man called Mehdi, who was finance minister. Uh, Vishnu Ram Mehdi. Vishnu Ram Mehdi. He really ran the show. And uh, I said, "Well, look, my mission here is to give you all the assistance possible because the government of India realizes that th- this problem here that we are facing is not merely a state problem." Its dimensions are much wider. It's of all India importance because you are you are linked to India by a thin um, umbilical cord, and if something happens in Assam, then uh, we lose our eastern frontier. Therefore, the government of India are taking the matter very very seriously, and I'm here to offer you the maximum assistance, whatever you need. So I tried to reassure them that way, and I asked whether any of the officials had had been down to see what was going on. Not a single official from the headquarters had gone down. So I said, "Now, please, would you do me a favor? Kindly appoint a, a relief and re- rehabilitation commissioner. We submit all our officers occupied in important positions." However, I happened to have taken a walk outside government house, and I saw a signboard of a gentleman called Mr. Bala Subramaniam, ICS. So there's certain fraternity in the service. So I just So Bal's done it. He was very surprised to see me. Who's this fellow coming? This northerner coming in? So I said, uh, "Well, I've just come here to have a look around." And, and then he took me to the club, and I met the other officials, chief secretary, finance secretary, all ICS men. But uh, all taking it very easy. So when when they asked me, like, "Whom can we appoint?" I said, "Look here, you've got a chap next door, Mr. Bal Subramaniam. He's the transport commissioner." I said, "Well, transport can wait, but this is more important." So Bala Subramaniam was sent for. He was playing tennis at the time. He arrived in his tennis things, and he was told by the governor, "You are appointed a relief and rehabilitation commissioner." So he got very worried. He said, "Sir, but I am taking leave. I am going to Kerala with my family for six weeks. Please cancel your leave." So anyway, so then I took a car and I toured all over the place. I went. Uh, All the way, all the plains districts, Tezpur and uh, Dibrugarh and Naugong, all along. A government house car with, a, with my mosquito net and so on. Mm-hmm. And was it there? The British used to say in Assam that you should always boil your water, but invariably drink gin. So, but since I'm not a gin drinker, I used to, I used to drink tea. Tea you can get everywhere, very good tea. 
And, and I, was, I was amazed at what I saw. See, all the deputy commissioners were very, very junior people who had been just pushed up and they had no idea as to what was going on in the district. They never moved out. Whereas I, moving around there to reach those districts by car, saw what had happened. Whole village areas had been completely devastated. Villages had been burnt down. See, the hill folk had come down, they had slaughtered people, chased them away, and uh, got rid of them. And they were mostly uh, Bengalis, both Muslims and Hindus. Village after village, we just saw charred stumps and cattle grazing in, in the rice, rice paddies, newly planted rice. I went up to, to Nagaland, right to Imphal. By this time, my wife had accompanied me, so we both down, went down that road. There was still trouble going on with the, with the Nagas. But we were neither kidnapped nor scalped by them. We, we made it and came back. It was, but it was quite an experience. It's a very beautiful, but uh, seemed very, very badly administered. And uh, I have to organize a rehabilitation. Large numbers of refugees in, uh, lived in appalling conditions. We set up camps for them, and this, that, the other huts from the forest department, you know, all, all that sort of thing was done. My final report, I, I wrote that Assam is eloquently represented by a state symbol of the rhinoceros, an animal noted for the thickness of its hide, its short-sightedness, and its incapacity for survival unless artificially protected. With this report, I came away mm -hmm. to Delhi. When I arrived here... Your reports had already come? Yes, yes. I kept on sending them off all the time, one after another. And uh, they had been read by the Sardar, they had been read by Panditji. So, uh, and then I, I learned to my horror that they were then sent to the Assam government. And one of my recommendations was that uh, since some of the old Assam, Assam officers were really almost functus officio, they should send a few, a few vigorous officers to do, do a job of work there. Especially the chief secretary who should organize the whole thing. Well, having done this, I took my belated leave and went off to the hills. I got a letter saying that the uh, government had accepted my recommendations. One of which, of course, was that it was really a political problem. Mm -hmm. Because the Assamese government wanted to Assamize the whole state. And they did not recognize the existence of a refugee problem. They said it was a conspiracy that these people are being brought in in order to change the racial, ethnic, mm -hmm. linguistic composition. Whereas they were interested in bringing in the, the Bengali Muslims who could then cultivate the char lands and the Bengali Muslims would, would vote for the Assamese. It's a very, interest, very interesting phenomenon. Now, and I said the whole administration has to be toned up and this problem has really to be sorted out. Assam can no longer be neglected as it was in the days of the British when it sort of ran itself and it was a kind of British mm -hmm. preserve. It's a I think what you saw today in Assam is continuation of the same thing. History is repeating itself. This problem was never solved. And uh, if it had been sorted out then, this influx of people coming in, the situation today might have been different. I sometimes ask people to, to look at those reports that I sent in, in the year 1950. Mm -hmm. March to June or July. Three months that you were there. Well, I just conclude this by saying that I found that they, they had, uh, government has said, well, this is a good report. We will send some new uh, some officers there who can put things right. The chief secretary will, will be Mr. Rajeshwar Dayal. I said, look, if you, you send my reports, it's been very candid. I've given my opinion about the, that government. I mean, if I go there, I'd be lynched. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not going there. I think that's, that's all the merit of that argument is they spared me that. So that's how your uh, sojourn in Assam for three months came to an end? Yes. Now tell me, was uh, it in some special situation that you were sent to UN as a member of the delegation? Where you remained thereafter? Yeah, yeah, yes. Well, when my leave ended, I came back to Delhi. And again, I was sent for by the Prime Minister. I think it was in 1950. In 1950. Yeah. So now, I think uh, July, August. And uh, he said to me, that, you know, uh, our permanent representative, Sir Benigal Rao, very distinguished and very great man, 
He was the head of the mission. We have not heard many things about him. Oh. I'll be grateful if you talk about the person also. He was a person for whom I had the utmost respect and admiration. As a head for Dr. Radha Krishna. He, uh, so Prime Minister said that he's uh, very ill. Mm -hmm. He's had an operation for cancer. And uh, he's out of, the, out of hospital, but he's weak. And, and uh, the Kashmir question is coming up and is boiling up. So Zafrullah Khan, aided by a big team, is there on the other side. And we want to strengthen our delegation. So you go off in time for the secure meeting with the Security Council and you go... In what capacity did you go there? I went as number two, as an alternate, alternate representative of the Security mm -hmm. Council. And Benegul uh, Narasingh Rao continued to be yes. the chief? Yes. He, he was both the permanent representative as well as the, the leader of the de delegation to the General Assembly. Well, in the first place, uh, the contrast between Moscow and uh, New York was something absolutely staggering. There in Moscow, when we're used to a life of uh, complete, almost of self abnegation, mm -hmm. we, we could get nothing, very austere kind of existence. Here you found that uh, consumer society and uh, utmost prosperity and extravagance, uh, pro uh, that's one aspect. But uh, so far as the work was concerned, it's certainly true that we were quite hard pressed. And uh, these uh, debates in the Security Council would go on almost endlessly. So Benegal Rao, I think, has made the, the best presentation of the Indian position mm -hmm. in the Security Council of any of our spokesmen there. He did not need a marathon speech to explain our position because the comment of the United Nations always is when such speeches are made, that must be a very weak case that needs a, such a lot of argumentation. So he did a half an hour, 40 minutes, and every word was meticulously chosen. He used to write out the, the script. He always said that, look, we are not making speeches, speeches here, we are not orators. We are making statements on behalf of our governments. There is not a place to pra practice oratory in. So every word was meticulously written out, discussed with me. If I had the slightest hesitation about one word, he'd say, well, give me a synonym or antonym, as the case mm -hmm. may be, and I'd, I'd do that. And, and uh, I think his, his position, the position he adopted was very, was very, very clear-cut and uh, unanswerable. I would recommend people to, to see some of his speeches. Mm -hmm. Very good reading, and they really put the issues plainly and squarely. But I did wonder why it was necessary for us to Vasu Gopal Swami Aingar, who was our first spokesman there, to have taken the sort of plea that was taken, which got us into endless uh, complications, which lasted for years, and uh, not yet resolved. I mean, we were, not, we, were not, we were not obliged to offer a plebiscite. Why? All the other states had been had adhered to one dominion as they then were, or the other, without a plebiscite, on the word of the, of the ruler. Why not uh, Kashmir? And in any case, the line we should have taken is that what we hold, we have. Did we take this line when you were there, um, our representative in no, Council? No, no. Our, our line was a very complicated legalistic one. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, no, why I am saying this? Because you would be able to dilate upon it much better. Yes. No, we, we had to act under instructions. Mm -hmm. And uh, till that time, the talk was of creating the necessary conditions for a plebiscite. Mm -hmm. That there should be a complete withdrawal of the invaders, which meant not only the Pakistani army, mm -hmm. but the so-called Azad Kashmir forces, mm -hmm. and, which were really part of the, part of the army, and uh, all paramilitary forces. And all this, the argument went on back and forth for years and years mm -hmm. as to what, what has to be drawn, what's not helped. The, the phrase that was used, which still rings in my ears, is the quantum and quality of forces. Quantum and quality. From our side or from, from our side? From our side. Mm -hmm. So, on this, the arguments used to go on. Because we were not there to make a policy in that question. We got instructions from Delhi. We could modify things to a certain extent of presentation and so on, but the, the actual line came from here.
it didn't unfortunately carry, carry very great conviction. And uh, so it was a hard battle all along. And uh, we had very little support from any, any party. Uh, when you circumscribed in the UN, because our, uh, as they say, Kashmir policy then was uh, not a firm policy, but a tentative one, and we had not made up our mind about many things. No, no, Kashmir policy was a firm policy. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was not expressed in the terms which would have, I think, really safeguarded our interests. The point is that under certain circumstances, the state had acceded to India. Well, that should have been the, the conclusion of the matter. But we threw the issue open by talking about plebiscite and then the, creating the necessary conditions for a plebiscite. And knowing the volatile temperament of the Kashmiri people, whose example which we see to the examples today, or all the time. It was a rather uncertain ground that we had chosen for ourselves. So, uh, before we move on to other thing, I was uh, requesting you about Sir Benigal. Yes. Personality. But uh, one more thought on the Kashmir issue. After the war, a great many new frontiers were created all over the world. In Europe you see the new frontiers, Asia new frontiers. Mm. They were created by the conditions, the post-war conditions. And uh, the borders of Kashmir were drawn also as a result of, uh, of post-independence arrangements, whatever they were. Unfortunately, force had to be used there. But then we should have, we should have stuck to the position, well, this is ours, and that's that. Instead of opening the, the whole ground for legalisms and long arguments and claims, counterclaims, all that sort of thing. That's how it went on? It is, that's how it's gone on. People were speaking for 20 years. Now, I think it's recognized that, look, we are there. We are there to stay, period. Let's stop all argumentation as to who's, got the, who's right, who's wrong. Mm -hmm. He who's there possesses nine-tenths of the law, period. As they say in Hindi, just ki lati us ki bhans. This is statecraft. How long did you remain in the UN during that particular stint? 1952? 54. I was four years there. Well, but could you tell me that uh, we could evolve uh, a definite UN policy as different from our uh, foreign policy towards other countries, number one? And what were the factors that gradually lent the stature to our country in UN? because you were permanent representative at certain point of time and also our member in Security Council handling many delicate issues that other than Kashmir and uh, concerning other countries in the world. Well, the great preoccupation of the Security Council at the time was the Korean War, which was being based with great ferocity. And uh, the Americans were very anxious to rope in mm -hmm. as many countries as they could on, on their side. Now here we branched out on an independent line. When the war first broke out, we did uh, agree that the North had aggressed against the South. And we sent some token help to the South. And a resolution was passed when the declaring the North as the aggressor. Mm -hmm. So the force there, it was really an American force, assisted by some contingents of other countries, came to be known as the United Nations Force, which wasn't in reality. Mm -hmm. But then we veered away from that position and didn't want to get uh, embroiled in the conflict there. So the next demand would have been for us to, us to send troops into, into Korea. Mm -hmm. And there we ran amidst the counter to the American position. And other Asian countries, which were rather bewildered, small countries, they didn't know what to do. They were, they were being pressurized. So uh, we then began to build up a certain position for ourselves that India became a significant country in the, in the United Nations because around it others began to cluster. Mm -hmm. And instead of, instead of being just one country voting in a certain direction, then two or three and four began to join us, you see. And then from this uh, developed the, the Afro-Asian group 
to start with. It was, first, it was first called the, the Arab Asian group. Arab countries and Indian and, and Asian countries joined together. The Africans had not come in yet. There were not many. Mm -hmm. But Ethiopia was to follow the American line. And uh, North Africa was still under colonial rule. Mm -hmm. Ethiopia also followed the Western line. And, but the Arabs, by and large, joined us. So we used to present kind of having meetings of the Arab Asian group, as it was called. Now, uh, while the Korean War was going on, we had cautioned the Western powers that, uh, that the Chinese would, would sweep down if you approach the, if you went okay. above the 30th parallel and approach the Yalu River. But MacArthur, who was a, a law unto himself, the commander of the American forces, he kept on pressing northwards. He crossed the 30th parallel, he got near the, the Yalu River, and he had predicted that the boys would come home by Christmas. And then what we had feared and had warned the Americans against, namely the, the Chinese coming in, that happened. The Chinese swept down like a flood and the American forces began to retreat all along. And at one point there was a danger that they might be thrown into the sea. Mm -hmm. It was a very serious situation. Because of their sheer number? Numbers of determination and also short lines of communication. It was a difficult war to sustain for such a long distance. And uh, so then Sir Benigal Rao was approached by the American delegate, uh, Senator Warren Austin, and by the British delegate, Sir Gladwin Jeb. Please approach the Chinese and uh, ask them to, to halt this war, we are prepared to halt. And as an Asian country, you can call the Asian countries together and appeal to them as an Asian power or Asian powers. Thereupon, we called a meeting in Sabanical Rao's apartment. This must have been in, in January 1951, to which uh, 12 or 13 delegates came. Also from Africa? No. Asia and the Arab countries, and I think there was one African, Ethiopian, and uh, we sat down and an appeal was drafted to the Chinese to stop. It was signed uh, by all except Turkey, said well, they are, they've got soldiers in the war and Ethiopia didn't sign. We were talking about the appeal to be sent by the Asian countries and the Security Council to China to hold the war, to which US were to respond or something. Yes, there was a Chinese delegate who had come to New York to answer a charge of aggression in the Security Council. And one copy was sent to him, uh, given to him by Sir Benigal Rao and myself. Was that person very important Chinese? Yes, official? General Wu. And uh, another copy was sent by the Secretary General to uh, Peking, China. Well, we were asked repeatedly by the Western envoys as to what the reply was because the position of the American troops was getting more and more difficult, indeed desperate. And uh, the line we took with General Wu was that, that the, the Chinese in repelling what they considered to be a threat should not themselves be guilty of breaching the 30th parallel between North and South Korea. Now, uh, ultimately we, got a, we went to see General Wu again and uh, the, his reply was, again in rather mysterious Chinese language, he said, you will see what you will see. And we were puzzled as to what this uh, formula meant. But as it happened, the Chinese, uh, for reasons which were not very clear at the time, they didn't seem to be military reasons because their advance was practically un unimpeded. They stopped more or less along the 30th parallel, along what's called the, the narrow waist line, the wasp line of Korea. And that is where the demilitarized zone today exists. Yes. Now, uh, to continue this uh, narrative, it was the 
end of the year, the council met again, and the assembly in Paris, Paris session, because the Americans were having a general election, mm. a presidential election, and it was thought inappropriate to hold the United Nations uh, General Assembly there. So Bedekal Rao had set his heart on being elected to the World Court, International Court of Justice of The Hague. So I, I took India's seat in the Security Council because he was himself a candidate. And uh, after some time, he got the necessary votes and was elected. This was just before Christmas, the Christmas break. Mm -hmm. My wife and I then went off, as most delegates did, to a little rest. We went up to Switzerland. There, after, I happened to pick up uh, much later a, a paper, an English paper, the Daily Mail. Mm -hmm. And there I saw the new delegate to the United Nations appointed, and that was my name. I was, I was most surprised, that was the first intimation I had that I was going to be the, uh, the chief delegate uh, to uh, succeed Sabinagal Rao. Mm. Well, then uh, so many other things happened that, uh, during my three and a half years or so as a permanent representative. The Kashmir question continued. This time uh, Dr. Graham was appointed as a mediator mm -hmm. and I had to leave the Indian team assisted by General Tamaya, Brigadier Manikshaw, now Field Marshal, mm -hmm. the two military advisors and uh, D.P. Dhar from Kashmir. I may add that at the Paris session when the Security Council met, that was where the decision was taken to appoint a mediator. And the reason for that is very interesting. When the Council met, I saw a news item that uh, Pakistan was setting up uh, a base which would be available to the Americans somewhere along the northwest frontier. And uh, I showed this to Mr. Yaakov Malik, ambassador of the United States, the Soviet Union. And I said, Well, look, you're equating India and Pakistan in their policies, but here's a uh, Pakistan offering a base to the Americans. So he got very interested. He said, well, we must do something about this. Now, then they made it clear that with a resolution insisting upon a plebiscite and so on, because there was already a to conduct the plebiscite. Mm -hmm. Admiral Nimitz, I Nimitz. Think it was, yes, was waiting in the wings. Mm -hmm. Then uh, it would be very difficult for us to wriggle out of it. At that session, Mr. Tatalbath had been sent to argue the Indian case, and Sagar Jashankar Bajpayee had come, mm -hmm. a very strong team, and Sheikh Abdullah had come. Himself, yes. Himself. And uh, D.P. Dhar and the others were there. And uh, I must say that uh, relations between all three were extremely bad. Our delegates? Yes. Mm -hmm. the, the Sheikh simply hated uh, Sagar Jashankar Bajpayee, and he said, that, well, he's a I can't trust him and he's this and that and the other. So if they had to communicate anything, I had to go and communicate it from one to the other. It was a fantastic situation. And between him, says Ethan Ward and Girija Shankar. I mean, I was a young man and I said, look here, these, these people of that stature, they're behaving like this. Tatalwad was sick all the time, he was in bed. He had arthritis, he couldn't even get up. And uh, Sigurja prepared a draft of a speech, showed to the Sheikh. So I went and saw it for the Sheikh, he said, I disagree with every word of it. And uh, poor Tatalwad was in bed. However, the final speech, the whole speech had to be telex to India mm -hmm. by code, sent by code to India. And when the OK came, then I showed it to Sheikh and he, I said, well, it has been approved in Delhi. So then he couldn't uh, say anything. And finally, Mr. Sitalbad got up from his bed of sickness and staggered to the council chamber and read out the speech, which he had no hand in uh, drafting. drafting. And Bajpayee used to say, look, I've written the speech, I might as well go and read it myself. But anyway, that's how it was. Mm -hmm. It was a great disappointment to see this going on. At that no, but could you tell me at this stage, what was there in Sheikh's mind that he differed from the position taken by Gerja Shankar Bajpayee? Because it also came in press at that time. I think they were rather allergic to each other. Because after all, we were fighting for a national cause. Mm -hmm. But not on any substantive matter concerning Kashmir. No, I, I didn't think so. At least I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't discern anything. Mm -hmm. 
This is not the, the only difference of opinion and more that I saw between uh, people who, for whom I expected uh, that they would set a certain example to the others, mm -hmm. also the United Nations. I may add that uh, when I was asked to join the Foreign Service, I consulted my brother and he said just avoid two things like the plague. Have nothing to do with Pakistan affairs, because that's the bottomless pit, and never get involved in delegation work, because the Indian delegation is always squabbling and they can never agree with each other. So I used to lament the fact that I got involved at the in United delegation. Nations with the delegation work. So what ultimately was the response of Mr. Yaakob Mali after after all? Well, he made it known that if they brought a resolution adverse to India, they would veto it. Mm -hmm. And this created a real, real panic among the Western delegates. Really? Absolute panic. Mm -hmm. And when the council was called... But why is it that Mr. Yaakob Malik uh, came on to the situation so favourable to India? Because there was evidence there that Pakistan was creating, creating bases or giving Americans bases... Nearer Soviet border. Near the Soviet border. You know, at that time it was uh, the theory that the soft underbelly of the Soviet Union should be encircled with mm -hmm. military might. And this was one of the... His famous... Yes, mm -hmm. soft underbelly. Then, uh, now that changed the situation. So then they wanted first to uh, adjourn the meeting, then finally they brought up a... There was, there was, no, there was no resolution. So they, they leaked it? In, or it was yes, yes, a, a deliberate statement? It, it came to be known, no, no statement, but came to be known that look, they are going to do this. Yes, you know, you, you feel these things there. Uh -huh. A lot of things are done in the corridors, you see. And uh, this little bit of uh, work I did was uh, in a corner of the delegates' lounge. I said, well, let's look at this. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what happened was the president of the council was asked to make a statement. Who was the president? It was a Brazilian, Ambassador Munoz. Gotcha to make a statement saying that he that uh, he has spoken to the members of the council and that he is appointing, appointing a mediator. Well, nobody could object to that. We didn't object to Russians, we didn't object to Pakistan, didn't object. Dr. Graham was appointed. Then it fell to, to my lot. And the old man was a very charming per person. Yeah. I mean, it fell to my lot to uh, get him thoroughly confused with the same formula of quality and quantum of forces, mm -hmm. ably assisted by the, my military advisors, the two generals. And at night we used to work out the tactics, sitting down together, as to what we'd do next day to confuse the old man. And, <laughs> and on the other side there was Sazafullah Khan leading their delegation, assisted by a whole, by Ahmad Shah Bukhari, my opposite number of the Pakistan delegation, and a general sheikh and a number of others. So I pressed Delhi to, to send somebody a little more experienced than myself. Banderjee said, oh, no, you handle it yourself. I mean, this is the sort of confidence he showed to, shown in us. So I, I kept things going and uh, we succeeded and uh, <laughs> day after day we'd meet there and nothing came out of it. Did the Soviet Union apply any veto actually when you were there or it came much later? Not when I was there. But because this Graham episode kept on for years. And uh, finally, the old man was given a room in the basement somewhere of the United Nations. I used to go and see him now and then. He'd ask me for books on Indian history and sociology and so I used to give him in his Other than Kashmir and Korea, did you have uh, any other problem in Security Council at that time or even at Raj? Well, there were problems all the time. The problem of uh, Palestine all the time, you see. And uh, then we had a question of South Africa, racial discrimination. I'm particularly interested in your uh, problem reacting problem. to Palestine thing because some time you have uh, to talk about it when you... Yes. The problems of colonialism, you see, all these things we were very much involved in. Mm -hmm. Quite apart from the economic and social problems, which I didn't handle personally, I was involved in the political yes, matters. Let me just add something more. That, uh, uh, Trivi Lee, the first Secretary General, mm -hmm. the Norwegian, had uh, made himself thoroughly unpopular with the, with the Soviet Union because they charged him with uh, towing the Western Line. And uh, after his first term of five years, they refused to recognize him any further. 
Western Palace? No, the Soviet Union. Achha. They insisted that he quit his office. Right. Now there was a stage made because uh, the Western Palace wanted him to continue. And this peculiar situation continued where the Russians would not recognize the Secretary General. At all? As the person usurping the chair of the Secretary General. It was a, a very, very undignified position for a man of his, stage, of, yeah. of his uh, standing to, be, to find himself in. And this went on for a very long time, I think a year or perhaps two years. But why did we not have somebody other than Mr. Tribulius? Well, then they began to propose various names. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one point, uh, the name of Sir Benigal Rao came up. But he himself declined mm -hmm. because he was a, a sick man. The name of uh, Lester Pearson came up. He was a very great man, mm -hmm. Prime Minister of Canada as he became Canada. subsequently. He was then Foreign Minister of Canada. And people of that stature. Until one day, I got a note from the French Embassy, from Ambassador Opino, yeah. saying that they had proposed another name. A long name, un unpronounceable, called Hammershoot. Mm. He was about 90 years old. Was he really? And he had been Prime Minister, so on, so on, so on, so on. So I telephoned, I said, look, uh, are you seriously proposing a man of 90? So he said, H -h why? So he said, you better have a look at your the note that you sent on to the emissions. They made a mistake and given the biographical data of his father and not of, of Hammerschult. Because Hammerschult was not, not till then su uh, such a well-known personality. He had functioned in the European economic community and in economic conferences, but not in the political field very much. Well, when his name came up, uh, no, nobody objected. The Americans said, well, so long as it's not a, an American nominee, and he's an unknown person, and uh, so, let, let's, uh, so he came in. Now, Amashul's style was very different to Trigvili's. Trigvili really ran after the bigger powers, and was rather autocratic and authoritarian, and I didn't get on too well with him. But Hammerschult he used to telephone me himself every now and then and say, look, if you happen to come around this building, I've got something very interesting to discuss. And he discussed all kinds of world issues, unconnected with India. And I, these meetings, when they went on, I got a little curious. I said, I wonder why he's consulting me. And I found that uh, he used to ask uh, about half a dozen permanent uh, delegates uh, for their advice and views. He was a modest man, extremely able, mm -hmm. very hardworking, and we got on very well together. So, um, Hamishil came during that stint of yours in the uh, UN? 1953. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, I had one occasion in which to take up with him a very sensitive matter concerning India and, and Kashmir. Mm -hmm. You know, there were, there were UN observers in, on the Kashmir the, the ceasefire line. Mm -hmm. And at that time there were American observers. I got instructions that, that they should be removed because Pakistan has, has joined uh, the Middle East mm -hmm. Eastern uh, P uh, Treaty Organization. And, the, and these people could not be considered to be neutral. neutrals. Now, Hamishul took the line, he said, look, uh, anyone who is nominated by the Secretary General must be considered to be a neutral, a neutral uh, irrespective of nationality, because they are now part of the UN setup, and I can't accept the principle that, that nationality should be taken into account in the case of a United Nations official. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I won't dispute that principle, because the Secretary General has the right to hire and fire, mm -hmm. we, we uphold that. but." Uh, at the same time, let's be practical, because supposing we deny them facilities, when, when they go to the forward areas, they stay with our own officers in their messes, we don't let them in, then what happens? So he said, yes, I see the point. And the solution was found that, he said, now I've, I've looked through the list, I find this, that so-and-so are due to leave, so-and-so are due to leave, so, so within a few months, three months, they'll all be out, because they'll not be replaced by Americans. Now, this was a very smooth 
solution, which uh, Pandit Nehru accepted, and it, it saved embarrassment both to us and to the Secretary General. I think you're rather pleased that this happened in that way. Another thing I should mention is that uh, we gave him very strong support on the issue of the staff, the independence of the staff. Mm. Those were the days of, uh, of McCarthyism, and uh, there was a, an inquisition going on into the... McCarthy Commission, as it was called then, functioning in America, it had started. It was an inquisition, and uh, Tribuli had given in to the to McCarthyism and demands for the investigation of American officials there, mm -hmm. one of whom committed suicide. Now, uh, and, and the staff was thoroughly demoralized as a result. We gave very strong support. I personally took up the matter in the, in the assembly and we uh, strengthened his hands. Also, at that time, we took up this issue of uh, a wider question of racial discrimination in South Africa and apartheid. Mm -hmm. Till then, the, the item was only concerning the treatment of Indians in South Africa. So that brought the Africans into it. And by this time, the Asian African group, and it was moving already in the direction of non-alignment. Beginning was made. Yes. The voting pattern was non-aligned. Mm -hmm. But Yugoslavia had been with us consistently, but they were not part of the group. Mm -hmm. Now, so far as the function of the UN is concerned, as you know, one of its uh, principal aims is the maintenance of international peace. Well, for various reasons, that became difficult because of the the policemen of the, who were expected to be policing the world, the superpowers, they fell out with each other. But uh, the UN could still play a great role in uh, marginal con uh, conflicts, as in Palestine, in Kashmir, in, in, in Greece, many other places, to take an action. And Ham should de develop this technique still mm -hmm. further as in the Congo or in Lebanon. He made it an effective force. Okay, yes. And, and he came to be known as, uh, as Mr. UN. And uh, the slogan was, leave it to Doug. Any problem arose, leave it to Doug to solve it. Mm -hmm. He was very ingenious, extremely hardworking, and a fine penetrating intellect. So we got on rather well, we found. Now, so far as the delegates are concerned, we had a very distinguished group of people coming in. When uh, this was uh, Pandit's game, on the delegation as leader, and Krishna Menon, who had been ousted from the High Commissionership, there were charges of some, the, the Jeep scandal and so on and so forth. So he was rather a broken man when he arrived. Really? Very broken man, he had, he had no work. And, uh, I was very sorry to see him. Poor health. He said he had been knocked down by a taxi, so he was lim limping and carrying a stick. And uh, so little by little he began to get involved in UN affairs, functioning in a style of his own. We also had uh, Nawab Ali Yawar Jang, who used to come from Argentina, where he was ambassador. Achai. And became firm friends. Then. Uh, was he not from Hyderabad Nawab family? Yes. Then Maharaja Jam Sahib of Nawanagar, very picturesque gentleman who... But did they make any mark in UN? Oh yes, I think they all personalities, they made a mark in the UN. And in Sabinical's time, the London Times, uh, in an article on the UN, said that the Indian delegation headed by Sabinical Rao moves about making peace like uh, like Hindu gods, as a state cook, like the delegation mm -hmm. led by Sabinical Rao to Hindu gods. Mm -hmm. So it's a great compliment to us, because Sabinical Rao's uh, advice always was, make your facts hard and your words soft, an advice that he meticulously followed himself. He was a very modest man and extremely well regarded by everybody, and even the public had tremendous uh, respect for him as a man of peace. Every speech that he made mm -hmm. appeared in, in full and ex extenso on the second page of the, of the New York Times mm -hmm. with this picture. So people, the man in the street uh, could recognize him. And when he went uh, walking along Fifth Avenue or somewhere, people would come up to him and say, can you give me an autograph, Sir Benigal, because you're a man of peace. 
See, this was our reputation at the time. When we were really involved in conflicts with the, with the, with the Americans over Korea, over Kashmir, South Africa, colonial questions, and all these matters. But we always played, made our facts hard and words soft. <laughs>